Chapter 7 German Trains Run on Time Content Warning Discussion of the Holocaust Depending on your location and maybe your age, you're more or less likely to have heard some variation of the cliché that German trains are especially punctual. Maybe this was transmitted to you with an underlying implication that this being the case has something to do with the German work ethic, German precision, German readiness to carry out orders. I mean, there might be something to that too, but the thing with the trains, is there something to that? Put a bit in that. The 1933 census had been vital data collection for Hitler's government. It was a crucial precondition for setting their agenda now that they were in power. A Dehomag office was set up right by the Reichstag on Alexanderplatz in Berlin. Over several floors, a densely packed staff would be clanging away on these punch card machines at a constant rate, processing the cards as they were coming in by the truckload. You'd have secretaries that were only just trained, would work shifts to get the most out of these expensive machines that didn't sleep. And what resulted was, among other things, an overview of the distribution of the Jewish population in the country. Following this census, the German government would find many more applications for this technology. After all, they had a lot of plans. Businesses were to be Aryanized, that is, stolen from Jewish business owners and given to Germans. Prisons were to be filled with all manner of undesirables, communists, antisocials, homosexuals, etc. And the German war machine was to be rebuilt. And I'd refer at this point to the preface of the last chapter, where I talk a little bit about these terms, um, communists, antisocials, etc. But also Aryans, right? These were all invented categories that came out of the Ministry of Bullshit Race Science. Um, the Nuremberg Laws were about codifying these categories into law. In any case, all of these tasks that I described there were made exponentially simpler by the use of this punch card technology. And Dehomag took on all of these for the Nazis' essential tasks designing the systems and the cards, producing the machines, I mean, printing the cards in the US and shipping them, expanding their operations, and as a result, counting huge profits. Heidinger managed the operations on the ground, and Watson oversaw the whole thing, and cabled Heidinger his approvals. An interesting detail about this a condition for any business working directly for the German government during this period was that they had to be Aryan-owned. In fact, in order to even call themselves Dehomag, De Deutsche Hollerit Maschinengesellschaft, that means German Hollerit Machine Company, to put that qualifier, German, in front of the name of your company, you had to be Aryan owned, your company had to be Aryan owned. So knowing this, IBM did their utmost to obscure the fact that the final decisions were actually being made by an American cabling instructions over from Manhattan. For the most part, Nazi officials bought into the lie, although higher ups were aware of the truth that Dehomag was just a subsidiary of this American company, IBM, and grudgingly had to come to terms with the fact that there simply was no alternative. The systems were too valuable, too embedded in the economy to be done away with. And so they participated in the charade. Of course, <clears throat> it was not only the Nazis who had to be misled. 
about this collaboration. It was clear from the onset that any news of IBM collaborating with the German government would be a bad look for them in the US as well. Eventually, over the years, as the policies of the German government intensified, this kind of collaboration would be construed as treasonous. Eventually, Watson would have to further obscure this line of communication by using a Swiss subsidiary as an intermediary. All of this time, just on a side note, Watson kept a close personal friendship with the president, FDR. But back to the treason. Beyond the need for punch card systems in the administration of the German government, huge parts of the German industry were also being transformed to work in tandem with the government and the growing war effort. Everything along the lines of steel and textile production, weapons manufacturing, infrastructure, trains, trains, right? All of these needed efficient new systems of administration too. All of these needed the hardware, that is the punch card machines, and the software, the single-use dollar-shaped cards themselves with their specific chemical composition and that were only produced in New York. And what they needed, Watson provided. For the biggest nerds among you, I'd like to clarify that uh, my use of the terms hardware and software. Those weren't used yet in, at that time in this context, even though it might seem intuitive with the hard metal frames and the soft paper. People wouldn't start actually talking about hardware and software until the 50s and in connection with computers. Although there is apparently a debate around the actual etymology and who to credit with coining these terms. I find it a little bit hard to give a shit about <laughs> this debate. And again, I'm not claiming that IBM was using those terms with respect to punch card technology. I only bring them up because I consider them a useful analogy. And I'm going to return to this topic um, in a way in a couple of months. So this is a heads up. You'll understand why I'm doing this clarification at all in a couple of months. <laughs> I'm in here for the long haul. On another side note, isn't it something in light of the 1984 themed ad that I mentioned at the beginning of this IBM saga, isn't it funny to see Dehomag's advertisements in Germany <laughs> in the 30s? I mean, this imagery would fit right into this surveillance state described in the novel 1984, which that Apple ad was referencing. A novel which, of course, wouldn't be written for another decade in 1948. If you're in the audio-only version, what we're looking at here is a black poster at the top. We've got the word Übersicht, overview. Underneath that, we've got a giant eye, and it's shining down like a spotlight where we see the shape of a factory silhouetted against the backdrop of a punch card, right? The, the overview with Hollerit punch cards, Dehomag. <clears throat> Watson, in the early years of the Hitler government, would lobby for easing up the sanctions and opening up trade with Germany. He would try to convince his friends in the American government as well as try to sway public opinion when he wrote his op-eds. As a fervent believer in radical, unregulated, free market capitalism, he felt that peace would only be assured through the opening up of the market, meeting Germany eye to eye to assuage. To what extent he truly believed this, or was just trying to ensure that what he was already doing would not be construed as illegal, you know, one can only speculate about that. But clearly, he did go to some effort. In fact, in 1937, he was elected as president of the newly formed International Chamber of Commerce. The ceremony for this, as per his own wish, was held 
in Berlin. Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's infamous minister of propaganda, threw Watson a big party. And there, Adolf Hitler himself honored Thomas Watson with a medal, the Order of the German Eagle, the highest civilian honor for a non-German who is nonetheless worthy of the German people. Fun fact, uh, Henry Ford, famous anti-Semite, received the same honor. The keynote for the event, <clears throat> held by Watson, was world peace through world trade. I imagine it might be unnecessary to point out that didn't age that well. Now Hitler <clears throat> actually had an issue with the results of this 1933 census from the last chapter. It only counted a couple of hundred thousand Jews. To his mind, there should have been more. There would have to be another census one where not only one's personal religious affiliation was recorded, but that of one's grandparents. Long gone were the days of a census taking a decade to complete. There would be one in 1937, and when that still did not count enough Jews, more adaptations were made, and another census was carried out just two years later. In the U.S., the Roosevelt administration as you might be aware, was also introducing some fundamental restructuring to American society during the 30s. Of a very different kind, of course. Among the many reforms taking place under the mantle of the New Deal, one especially significant matter was the introduction of a social security system in 1935. His administration had some concerns that the introduction of a vast new bureaucratic apparatus would be just too complex, too great a task to achieve. But for some reason that FDR would not have guessed, IBM knew just how to go about it. This was another unfathomably lucrative commission for Watson. When, in 1939, the Nazis marched into Poland, marking the beginning of the Second World War, they were surprised and delighted to find that IBM had already set up a subsidiary and conducted a national census from there too, using the same technology. The story is gonna continue next week and I feel compelled to warn you that next week is the low point in this saga. See you around. Thanks for listening.